When it comes to modifying any engine, engine tuning or engine management is one of the key aspects. And the options are that we go for an aftermarket standalone ECU or we retune or reflash the factory ECU. There's two schools of thought there, there's a lot of debate about which is the correct option. And behind me we've got a thousand wheel horsepower, 2005 Subaru WRX running on a Cobb access port and we're going to find out how it achieves that power running a reflash system. First of all, Eric, Cobb access port, what made you go that route instead of a standalone on what is a heavy, heavily modified Subaru? So with the, the Cobb access port, the main reason why we chose this option was the car, the, the customer built this car from the ground up with the, you know, this, the factory computer was in the car. Um, he, he started modifying the car, adding horsepower, adding horsepower, and so you have to tune it. And at the time, the Cobb access port was one of the best options on the market aside from some of the more limited standalones of you know 10 years ago. So we went with the access port, we've continued to develop the car and the car has continued to build more and more horsepower and the access port's kind of just been along for the ride. But fortunately, the company that's behind it, Cobb Tuning has been very supportive in developing new features and new functionalities of the tuning software to allow us to access more and more of the factory computer change more tables and get the control that we've needed to, to put a thousand horsepower to the wheels out of you know 2005 WRX. Now, for those who aren't really aware of what the term reflashing means, so I'll just back up a little bit and we'll talk briefly about that. So what we're talking about here is uh, accessing and modifying all of the calibration maps that are fitted inside of the factory ECU. So essentially you've got the power to retune that ECU in exactly the same way as the Subaru factory engineers do. Yeah. Now, the Cobb Access port is a software and hardware interface that allows you to do so. So can you just briefly talk us through how you use the Cobb Access port to make a change? So basically the Cobb Access port has a software that we load onto the laptop and the software has the calibration file from the computer that's, that's in the car stock factory, just how it came from Subaru. And they've unlocked hundreds of tables within that that are the air fuel target tables, timing tables, you know, the boost control tables, all of that, and have allowed us to change in the software the essentially just what the, the values in those tables are. When we change those values, we load it onto the access port device and then flash it to the car through the OBD2 port. So basically that tune file that, that was on the car from Subaru has now been modified by us and put back on the car, still running on, this, on the Subaru computer with all of the um, you know the, the factory settings behind it, but it's been modified to take advantage of different air flows, different fuel injectors, all those different things that we've changed on the car. Now I want to talk about some of those changes because obviously we can understand that the factory ECU is probably an excellent choice for a car that's stock or relatively close to, but in this case you've taken a, a factory engine that was perhaps 250 to 300 horsepower flywheel, now modified it to well over a thousand. So one of the limitations I want to talk about there is in factory form the Subaru ECU relies heavily on the mass airflow sensor. Now those have a resolution that allows them to measure a certain amount of airflow. Clearly you're well, well and truly exceeding what was ever expected from any Subaru engineer. So how do you deal with being the ECU being able to measure the airflow correctly? So one of the things that, that Cobb Tuning did was they have modified some of the core logic tables in the computer to allow us to run uh, what's called a speed density map which uses you know, actual volume airflow that's calculated as opposed to measured through a math. And by calculating the airflow, you're not limited to a single sensor determining ultimately how much air is coming through it. Um, that, there's, the, the way that they did that is you know, some kind of an engineer that they have behind the scenes. Um, but they're actually, they're using tables that do exist in the computer from the factory. There's underlying speed density values, like when you unplug the mass airflow meter on the car, it still runs. And that's some underlying table that they've basically taken from being an underlying table to being a, an over, a, a command table. Um, so essentially we've got some really smart engineers yeah, really working smart engineer. at Cobb who have taken how the factory Subaru ECU was intended to work and modified it to be much more suited for our purposes in yes. the aftermarket. So one of the common problems that we find when it comes to reflashing a factory ECU compared to tuning an aftermarket standalone is more often than not with reflashing we can't make the tuning changes live. What we've instead got to do is make all of our tuning changes, shut the engine off and then flash those 
those changes into the ECU and that's a process that can take anywhere from 30 seconds to several minutes. Now particularly when it comes to populating uh, a completely empty speed density or VE table, that sounds really time consuming. How do you deal with that? So one of the really nice things that the, that the, the engineers at Cobb Tuning have done is they have, through the Cobb Tuning Access Tuner software, have allowed us to plug in directly from our laptop to the access port device and then into the OBD2 port on the car and make live changes directly to the ECU. Not all of the tables have been unlocked for live tuning. There's only a certain amount of memory that, that is available for live tuning, but they've essentially unlocked the primary tables that you would use to tune the car, the speed density table, if you're still doing a MAF tune, the MAF table, um, timing maps are all live, the air fuel target maps are live, the variable cam timing maps are live. So that it gives you not, probably 95% of what you do while you're on the dyno is live tuning through the software. Now there still is reflashes that have to happen um, when you make major changes deeper into the logic, um, scalar changes, you're changing the map sensor, something like that. You do have to reflash. It takes 30 seconds. It's not a big, super time consuming. It's not like some of these BMWs that take an hour. So realistically what Cobb have done there is, is almost sort of uh, blended that gap between yes. what we used to expect with a reflash and what, what we'd expect with an aftermarket standalone? Absolutely. It's, it functions, I would say, better than most of the, you know, older standalones that were on the, on the market. There are newer standalones, obviously, that have a lot more capability, but this uses the factory computer essentially like a standalone, which is, which is why we're still using it. I think one of the aspects that is often overlooked as well is when we reach for a standalone aftermarket ECU, we're, we're looking at an ECU that is designed to be relatively universal. It could run literally hundreds of different engines and do a pretty good job on any of those different engines. When you are reflashing the factory ECU, instead you're reflashing an ECU that was designed from the ground up with one intention, which was to run that specific engine engine and that specific chassis so you've got a lot more tables in there to make that particular engine run as well as it possibly can so often we hear reports that drivability, cold start, idle speed control, all, all of those sort of aspects are much nicer than we can often achieve on a standalone. Would you say that's fair? Absolutely. One of the really nice things with the access port and like you, you mentioned the the factory computer on this car was designed for the factory triggers. One of the biggest problems with standalones that you run into is that they are designed to run a trigger for a Chevy, a Ford, a Subaru, a Honda. All of those things have different trigger patterns. They have to have logic written in. This has one. Most of those standalone ECUs, when they run the triggers, at least from the ones that I've worked with, they're not even necessarily actually able to, to use the true trigger that's on the car. This, this car's trigger wheel has it's basically 24 teeth, but it has two of them that are shaped different and a space here and another space here. And on a standalone, the way that they usually handle that is they just ignore it. On this, it's actually gonna see those spaces and able to sink off of just the crank much faster, the crank and the cam much faster. And so you don't ever really have timing control issues. You don't run into timing sync, um, cold start issues where you're just not getting stat sync and you're not, not able to start the car or something we've never had, had ran into on this unless you know you actually have a sensor failure which if you have that on a standalone now you're knocking your head against a wall wondering is my sensor working or is it something in the calibration on this you know that that part is good and so it takes a lot of the headache out of at least setting up a car from scratch so now in terms of modifying a street car uh, I can understand obviously the, the reflash makes a lot of sense there. I think where we see a lot of people moving into a grey area of whether they reach for a standalone uh, or reflash the factory ECU is when it comes to a competition car. Now, obviously in competition use there are some functions that may not normally be incorporated in a factory ECU, launch control, traction control, uh, flat shift, gear cut ignition control and also data analysis, data logging. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, whether there are any limitations in the Cobb product in those areas? So the, there are limitations for sure, um, we'll just kind of work backwards to that. Data logging, the Cobb access port data logs fairly well, but it is data logging through the OBD2 port, which is inherently slow. And so your, your refresh rate, your, your, the, the amount of data you can actually get from the engine computer into the access port and then onto your laptop is often lacking. Um, additional to that, the, the number of parameters that you have 
are all factory parameters that are logged by the, the factory ECU, but not necessarily what you might want to look at, like oil pressure, oil temperature, you know, extra things. Now they are adding systems, on, especially on the newer model years, to allow custom logging abilities. Um, but some of these older older model years like this one don't have that capability, so it is it is a limitation. But they are working constantly and adding features like custom data tables, custom logging capabilities, flex fuel capabilities, um, things of that nature. So it's it is limited, but it's getting better and it's constantly evolving, which is really nice. Right, we've talked a little bit about the car. I've mentioned the fact that it makes close to a thousand wheel horsepower and it's gone co close to 200 mile an hour. I'll just find out a little bit more about how you're achieving that sort of power level. So can you tell us what fuel you're running on, what turbo is fitted and what boost pressure the engine's running? So the, uh, the fuel we're running is ethanol fuel. It's a 98% ethanol. Um, it's from uh, Thunderbolt Racing. The turbocharger that's on there is a Precision 7675. Um, it's a fairly large turbo. It's their newest Gen 2 to aerodynamics. Um, we went with that turbo specifically for this race event. We, we had a smaller turbo on there that was making the boost that we needed, but when we'd come to elevation, we couldn't get the boost that we wanted out of the car. So we fitted this larger turbo in order to hopefully remedy that problem. We're, our target boost pressure today is hopefully around 52 to 53 pounds. So the first pass out, we hit about 45. So we're gonna work to try to get that boost pressure back up and see if we can get back to, to our target boost, which should get us down the track to close to 200 miles an hour. And for those watching who aren't aware, we are here uh, at Colorado Springs at Airstrip Attack where the altitude is around about 1900 metres. So we're seeing barometric air pressure today of close to 80 kPa. So this is why it makes it harder to make that boost pressure and also harder to make power at this altitude. Absolutely. We're from basically sea level in Portland, Oregon. So we're 105 kPa. And so coming up here, losing all of that, um, it's, it's, it's rough trying to get the car to make the boost. Um, it's a small motor, it's only a two and a half liter engine, so you're trying to spin that turbo real hard in order to get that boost. Um, so we're hoping we can get it back up there and get out and do, do what we came to do. Alright, thanks for the chat there Eric, great to get some more insight into that Cobb product and uh, we wish you all the best for the rest of the weekend. Let's see if you can crack that 200 mile an hour, cheers. Absolutely, thank you. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning and you'll also have the chance to ask questions which I'll be answering live. Remember it's 100% free so follow the link to claim your spot.